Hello and welcome to this Revision Monkey video on what's going to be in the 2022 exams. This video is for the AQA specification and it's for separate scientists. So those are people that do six one hour and 45 minute exams at the end of their course, sometimes called triple scientists in some schools. And this video is going to focus on chemistry paper one and it is for higher tier students only. So do check with your teacher to make sure you're looking at the right video for you. First of all, the examiners have told us which topics won't be assessed in the paper. And there's only one that they've mentioned for chemistry paper one separate, and that is the bulk and surface properties of matter, including nanoparticles. They have told us the required practicals to focus on, and those are salts, titrations, and endo and exothermic reactions. I've done a separate video focusing on just these three in detail, and I'll put a link in the description that you can go to look at the required practicals. They've told us the topics which will be of major focus in the exam, so where you can focus your revision. And these are the periodic table, chemical bonds, ionic, covalent and metallic, how bonding and structure are related to the properties of substances, structure and bonding of carbon, use of amount of substances in relation to masses of pure substances, so these will be calculations, reactivity of metals, reactions of acids, electrolysis and exothermic and endothermic reactions. So these are the topics which will feature in this video. Now we'll look at how the periodic table was developed. Originally scientists were grouping elements, these different types of atom, in order of atomic mass. That's the only thing that they knew about the elements when they were trying to arrange them and group them in a particular way. They didn't know about proton number or the number of electrons or neutrons they had. So this is the only thing that they could order them by. But trouble is that led to very early periodic tables where there were metals, for example, like lithium, grouped with non-metals, like oxygen, things with completely different properties like magnesium and sulphur grouped together. Mendeleev in 1869 developed a table whereby he still ordered them in terms of atomic mass because he didn't know about the other um, structural properties of the atoms. However, he tried to group them with similar physical and chemi chemical properties. And actually, his periodic table was famous because he left gaps in the periodic table. He didn't try and force elements together. He left gaps where things didn't fit the pattern. And in fact, he said, well, these elements just haven't been discovered yet. And he was clever enough to predict their properties of these elements. And later they were found out to be correct and the elements were discovered to fill the gaps that he had left in his periodic table. So you can see here he's starting to develop these group one metals here. Some of them are a little bit different. We've got copper in here, which we know in the modern periodic table it isn't here but we're starting to get elements with similar properties grouped together in the same columns. The modern periodic table then builds on from Mendeleev's ideas of grouping elements with similar properties together however the elements are now in order of atomic number so since the discovery of protons we have rearranged these elements and put them in order of atomic number or proton number rather than mass. And yes, with most of the elements, 
an increase in atomic number also means an increase in, in mass. But actually, if you look through the periodic table in detail, you notice sometimes that this is not the case. So it goes up um, by one each time, an increasing number of atomic number. And every time you change the atomic number, you've got a different element. So gaps are now filled. So elements such as germanium filled in there where Mendeleev predicted the properties of the elements that he didn't have in his, his periodic table. The columns in the periodic table are called groups. And we said before when we looked at electron structure, that tells you the number of electrons in the outer shell. So all of these have one electron in the outer shell. All of these have two and so on. And the rows are called periods. And as you go down each period, you add an electron shell onto the atom and it increases in size as you go down. So helium here has one electron shell. These uh, elements in period two have two electron shells, three and so on and so forth until the atoms get bigger in size. Again, similar elements grouped together with similar properties. For example, here we've got all the reactive metals over here. This group, group one, is called the alkali metals. You'll need to know the middle block as the transition metals. So just remind yourself of the general properties of metals in, in the fact that they are strong. You can bend them and hammer them into the shape. We call these malleable. That means you can bend and shape them. They're good conductors of heat and electricity. And they also have high boiling and melting points. And in fact, the majority of the elements in the periodic table are metals. There's an invisible line, which you won't have on your periodic table, but it zigzags down here like so and on the left hand side of this line so all of these elements here are metals and on the right hand side all of these elements here are non-metals. Within the non-metals there's two groups that you need to be aware of and be able to name. Group 7 is the halogens and group zero are the noble gases. We need to know a little bit more detail about group one, the alkali metals. A couple of common properties of these metals is that they're soft. You may well have seen your teacher cut these metals with a scalpel when they're doing an experiment. And they have low density. And you may well have seen with the reactions on water that many of them are less dense than water, so will appear on the surface rather than sinking to the bottom. We said earlier with um, going down the periodic table, as you go down each period, you increase the number of electron shells. So the elements at the bottom will have a large number of electron shells compared to the elements at the top. And this will affect the properties of the elements as you go down the group. And what you'll find is as you go down group one, you will increase the reactivity. And we'll discuss why in just a sec. And you will lower the melting and boiling points. So with these electrons, we said that they're there are more electron shells as you go down the group. They've still all got a positive charge from that nucleus, which contains the protons and the neutrons, giving it positive charge overall. And group one metals want to give away the electron that they have in their outer shell when they're bonding. Obviously, there are all the other electrons in between as well, but I'm not going to draw all of those, the 288, etc. But they all have one in the outer shell. And the reason that this atom here is more reactive than this one is because the electron that it wants to lose is a further distance from the nucleus. It's further away from the nucleus. 
whereas this one is closer to the nucleus. And if we're understanding the fact that the electron has a negative charge, which is attracted to the positive charge of the nucleus, you can understand that where they're really close together, the negative and the positive charge are closer. There's a stronger force of attraction between them, and it's easier for lithium to keep its outer electron. But for francium down here, the outer shell electron is really far away from the positive nucleus. There's a weaker force of attraction keeping the electron in place. So when these elements do react, they make positive ions, they make a plus one ion, so for example lithium, sodium, etc. They all make positive ions and you need to know about their reactions with water, chlorine and oxygen. So for all of them, when they react with water, let's take lithium for example, you will make a hydroxide, so in this case you'll make lithium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. You may have seen this in class when you um, cut the alkali metals put them in water and they will fizz around the top of the water. Obviously with increasing reactivity sometimes you'll get a flame like the potassium and the, and the rubidium, cesium and francium will be big explosions as well. With their low density they tend to sit on the top of the water as well and let's just balance this equation like so. So same with lithium and water would make lithium hydroxide and hydrogen if we were to do sodium plus water, that would be sodium plus water, and that would make sodium hydroxide plus hydrogen. This hydroxide is alkaline in water, and that's partly where the name alkali metals comes from, because they make alkaline compounds. Reactions with chlorine then, for example, um, sodium plus chlorine, would make sodium chloride, the salt. We balance that just like that. So reactions with chlorine would make a, a salt. The final reactions that we need to look at for the alkali metals are the reactions with oxygen. We only need to know the reactions of the first three alkali metals and each of the products that they can make is a little bit different. If we look at lithium first of all, when that reacts with oxygen that makes lithium oxide. Li2O, and that equation would need balancing. We'd need, because we've got two oxygens here, we need a 2 there, and that makes 4 lithium, so we need a 4 lithium there. When sodium reacts with oxygen, however, it can make two different products. It can make a mixture of things. So the first thing it can do is just like lithium above, we can have sodium reacting with oxygen to produce sodium oxide. However, as well as sodium oxide, there can also be another product produced which is called sodium peroxide, which is N, which has the formula Na2O2, and that needs to be balanced up like so. So that is called sodium peroxide. And with potassium, there are different products again. When potassium reacts with oxygen, it can, like sodium, make potassium peroxide, so K2O2, which we'll need to balance out like so. So potassium peroxide and it can also make a different chemical which is KO2 which is called potassium superoxide. So it'd be quite harsh in, in an exam if they expected you to remember all of these products, but you need to be aware that when they do react with oxygen, they make different products. Group 7 is called the halogens. We need to know these elements in a li little bit more detail. When they react, they make negative ions because they gain an electron, and they're called halide ions. This group is the opposite to group one in terms of reactivity. Reactivity decreases as you go down the group. And you get higher melting and boiling points.
for the opposite reason that we talked about in uh, group one. So to explain the reactivity in the halogens, we remember that as you go down the periods, you end up with atoms at the end of the group with lots and lots and lots of electron shells. We still have a positive charge in the nucleus, but this time the elements already have seven electrons in their outer shell and they need to gain an electron. So to gain an electron, the positive nucleus will want to attract a negative electron. So if, in this case, with this small atom here, there's a close distance between the outer shell and the nucleus, that's going to have a large force of attraction and you're able to easily attract another electron. Whereas in this larger atom here, we need to attract an electron here, but the distance is much greater between the nucleus and the outer shell, so there's a weaker force of attraction and it's much more difficult to attract an electron onto this atom. So the reactivity decreases as you go down, the smaller atoms are most reactive and the larger ones are less reactive. You also need to be aware that halogens are coloured gases, so fluorine is a yellow gas, hopefully you can see that colour on your screens. Chlorine is a green gas. Bromine is a red-brown liquid at room temperature. And iodine here is kind of a grey colour when it's a solid, but as it turns into a gas, that will make a purple gas or a purple vapour. Okay, so these are quite colourful elements. And the final thing you need to know about this group is the fact that they can, just like uh, metals, they can also be involved in displacement reactions, whereby more reactive halogens will displace less reactive ones. So, for example, if we take chlorine and then something that is less reactive, like iodine, well, if chlorine reacted with something like potassium iodide, the chlorine is more reactive than the iodine, so that will replace the iodine in the displacement reaction and you'd end up with potassium chloride and the iodine would be displaced. So if they're more reactive, they will displace those less reactive halogens. The final group that you need to know about in a little, little bit more detail are the noble gases. They are group zero. Um, they all have a full outer shell. Helium has two electrons in its outer shell and that makes it full because it only has one shell. All of the other elements in the group have eight electrons in their outer shell. So having a full outer shell means that you are unreactive or you might see that written as inert. It won't react with other things. Um, so it makes them non-flammable. It's often the case that things like argon and neon are used to transport um, some of these reactive metals over here because these would react with oxygen but they're not going to react with an environment of neon or argon so you'll see a lot of those um, being used for that reason. They are all colourless gases, they all uh, go about on their own so they are monatomic um, unlike the halogens, which are diatomic, they go around in pairs. For example, chlorine, that's why you see it as Cl2, that's diatomic, it goes around as a pair. All of these don't react with anything else, so they're just monatomic and go around on their own. And as you go down the group, obviously the reactivity doesn't change because they are all unreactive, but they have higher melting points. and boiling points as you go down the group. States of matter um, quite simply means whether something is in a solid, a liquid or a gas state. This is a topic that also comes up in physics, topic three as well. 
Um, so if you learn this bit for chemistry, that will also help you for physics as well and vice versa. So here we've got the three different models that we can um, use. So this one represents a solid, this one represents a liquid and this one a gas. And it's showing how the particles are arranged depending on whether the substance is in a solid state, a liquid state or a gas state. Within chemistry, we also write these as state symbols in chemical equations. So you can see here we've got solid, liquid, and gas. And the final one here, the AQ, means it's aqueous, which is in solution, okay, or dissolved. So AQ stands for aqueous. So for a solid, if you're asked to describe the arrangement of particles, we need to be talking about the fact that they are in fixed positions. The particles are vibrating, which you can't see by this diagram, but they are vibrating. The, the particles in the solid form a definite shape and volume. And there are strong forces between the particles. For a liquid, the particles are close, but they move over each other. They're moving randomly. Liquids don't have any definite shape. So, for example, if you had a container and you were to pour the liquid in the container, it would just take the shape of the bottom of that container. There are weak forces between the particles, which allows them to move over each other. With a gas, the particles are far apart. The particles are moving randomly in all directions. A gas has no definite shape, and in fact this will, this will fill and take the shape of any container that you put them in. So if you were to put a gas into this container, it would completely fill the container and take the full shape of the container. And there are very weak forces between the particles, weak intermolecular forces, and they can move past each other and be far apart. Higher tier pupils will need to be able to write about the limitations of the model. So that just means what limits there are to drawing particles in this way as a solid, liquid or a gas. So what the examiner is looking for is the idea that particles aren't really spherical Particles will come in all different shapes and sizes depending on what they are. So for example, if you had a water molecule that was H2O, that wouldn't be spherical, that might occupy this kind of shape instead. However, in these diagrams, we always draw them as spheres. The particles aren't solid either. Yet we still draw them as solid spheres. And these diagrams here don't show the forces between the particles. So that's from our own knowledge. We don't see from these diagrams that these have strong forces between the particles, that these have weaker forces, and these have very weak forces between the particles because they are not shown. Substances can change state between solid, liquids and gases depending on whether energy is gained or lost by the particles. So the change of state between a solid and a liquid is called melting. If you were to heat the substance up further from a liquid to a gas, that change of state is called boiling. On the other side, you can cool the substance down and if you cool the gas, you can condense it to form a liquid and if you cool a liquid down far enough you can freeze it into a solid. Now the melting point and the freezing point happen at the same temperature depends whether you're heating it up or cooling it down and the boiling point and the condensing point happen at exactly the same temperature. For example if the boiling point of a substance was 1083 degrees C for example then that would be the condensing point of the substance as well. If the melting point was say 400 degrees C then that would also be the freezing point. It all depends whether you're heating the substance up 
or calling it town, depending on which change of state you would be calling it. So if you're on this side, you are gaining energy. So the particles are gaining energy to move from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas. And the particles are moving more. They're already moving or already vibrating in terms of the solid. So we're talking about them moving more. And by moving more, they are overcoming the bonds that are holding them in place. So, for example, if we remember our solid model, we've got particles that are vibrating with strong bonds holding the particles together. But if those particles gain energy, they are going to vibrate more and then they are going to overcome these strong bonds that are holding them in place until they turn into a liquid where they can move over each other and have weaker forces of attraction between the particles. If a substance is being cooled down, it is going to be losing energy to the surroundings and therefore they don't have enough energy this time to overcome the forces of attraction. And as they lose energy and then therefore can't overcome these forces, you will end up with bonds forming between the particles as it changes state. So here we're going to get more stronger bonds forming between the particles to make it a liquid and even stronger bonds forming between the particles to turn it into a solid. Perhaps the most difficult thing with changes of state that you might be asked to do is interpret tables giving information on melting and boiling points for example. You need to remember that melting point is exactly the same as freezing point and boiling point is exactly the same as condensing point in terms of the temperature that they occur at. So for example if they said what is the state of oxygen at minus 100 degrees C perhaps the easiest way to do it might be to write out the solid liquids and gas and realize that from the table oxygen melts at minus 218 so that would be its melting point and also its freezing point, so we can write those in, and it boils at minus 183 degrees C, and that means it would also condense at minus 183 degrees C. So if the number is lower than the minus 218, that would be a solid. If the number here falls between minus 218.4, and minus 183 that would mean it would be a liquid but as minus 100 is smaller than minus 183 it falls in this side so oxygen would be a gas. For carbon it says what is the state of carbon at 3600 again I go to write my solid liquid and gas for carbon and we can see that the melting point is 3500 so is the freezing point and the boiling point is 4827 and so is the condensing point. So where does 3600 fall? Well it falls between these two numbers here. 3600 falls between these two numbers so that means that the carbon must be a liquid at 3600 degrees. Ions are charged particles. As we can see here, we've got one that is positively charged and one that is negatively charged. And on the left hand side here, we've got what they originally were, and that was an atom. So here we've got an atom with 11 electrons. It's got one in its outer shell, so we know it's from group one. And to turn into an ion, this atom has to lose its outer shell electron. So it loses an electron, I'll just write E for an electron, and it turns into an ion. And because it loses a negative charge, 
it now becomes positively charged. To explain that, in this atom, if you remember, it has no overall charge, so it has 11 electrons, which we can write as negatives, and it also has 11 protons. So in this case, all of the charges balance each other out. However, when it turns into an ion, as we said, it loses an electron, so it loses one of those positive, one of those negative charges, sorry, and turns into a positively charged ion. And you can see probably now the reason why it becomes positive, because here we've still got the charges cancelling each other out. However, for the ion here, it now has not got that electron cancelling out the positive charge, so overall it becomes positively charged. If you look at this case, however, we've got an element from group 7. It has 7 electrons in its outer shell, so rather than losing 7 electrons, it's easier for it to gain one electron in this position here to give it a full outer shell. The whole point of these is they're trying to get um, the structure of a noble gas. They're trying to get a full outer shell. So in this case, the atom will gain an electron, and because it's gained a negative charge, it becomes negatively charged overall. So if atoms, metals, all turn into positive ions, they all lose electrons. So elements in groups 1, two, three will lose electrons and the transition metals as well will lose electrons and become positively charged ions whereas negatively charged ions are mainly non-metals except hydrogen that becomes positive but non-metals like the halogens, chlorine, bromine etc will become negative ions. So you can perhaps see what's going to happen when we've got something that's positively charged, a metal ion and something that's negatively charged, a non-metal ion, these two will attract each other and will be able to bond. So you can see here in this example we've got atoms on the left hand side and we're now going to draw the ions. In this case this is a group 2 element, it has two electrons in its outer shell so this time it needs to lose two electrons. So we'll keep the inner electrons and the second shell electrons but this time it loses the outer electrons and the important thing is to put brackets around the ion and because it's lost two negative charges it now becomes 2 plus. With this element here, this is in group 6 because it has 6 electrons in its outer shell, it needs two more here. So when we draw the ion, we often draw the additional electrons as a circle instead of crosses but it won't matter too much. And because it's gained two electrons, it's gained two negative charges, so this now has a charge of two minus. So with the positive and negative ions that we've just discussed, these can attract each other and bond together. And this is exactly what we mean by ionic bonding. So ionic bonding is between a metal and a non-metal. And we said that metals are the ions that have a positive charge and non-metals have a negative charge and they attract with each other. For example, this could be sodium, Na+, and this could be chlorine, Cl-, and when these react together, they will make a compound called sodium chloride. Now to write the formula, we need to look at the charges, because that is a single plus and that is a single minus, we just need one of each and put them together like so, NaCl. However, if this um, ion here was magnesium, magnesium is in group 2, so it has a charge of 2 plus. If we we're bonding that with chlorine, we can't just put them both together because this is 2 plus and 1 minus. So we'd need two chloride ions to balance out the charge of the magnesium, so we need to write MgCl2. Similarly, if you had sodium bonding with oxygen, because oxygen is 2 minus, 
this time you'd need two sodiums, so you'd write Na2O. So this is how you'd write the formula of the ionic compounds. Now they all have a very similar structure and it looks something like this in this picture just here. Because it's not just the case that one ion will bond with another ion and they will go round together. They actually form a giant structure. So you can see here there's a big lattice of positive and negative ions all um, in one big structure. So we call it a giant structure. We call it a lattice. If they ask about structure, you need to talk about the fact that it's made out of positive and negative ions. And keeping the, those ions together, they're shown together by um, a bond in this diagram, but we call those forces electrostatic forces because they're charged particles, they're charged um, ions, it's electrostatic forces act in all directions to keep that structure together. Check very carefully in the exam whether they're actually asking you about properties or structure or both because properties are a bit different. Properties are talking about melting points and boiling points for example. These ionic compounds have high melting points and high boiling points. Um, they don't conduct electricity when they are a solid, but they will conduct electricity when they are molten, and I'll explain why in just a sec. So they only conduct electricity when molten, which means when they're melted down into a liquid. Um, for example, in this case here, you've got positive and negative ions throughout. However, they are fixed, they cannot move. Electricity is the flow of charge, or current is the flow of charge, but at the moment in this solid state here, these ions cannot flow. However, if you make them molten, you then have a situation where you've got your sodium, for example, and chloride ions in there, but they are now free to flow. This is important for electricity. And if these ions are free to flow, that means charge, because the ions are charged, is moving around. A second type of bonding is covalent bonding. And covalent bonding is between non-metals. So you could have two of the same element. For example, here you've got chlorine. Or you can have two different non-metals bonding together. For example, methane. You can see from these diagrams that these particles aren't charged and instead they're sharing electrons. So there's no um, transfer of electrons this time. Instead, they just bond together by this really strong bond because they're sharing electrons. We can draw this in other ways. We can draw the covalent bond simply as a straight line to show a covalent bond. So you can do that for both of them. And you may well see diagrams in this format, these lines show a covalent bond, or you can draw it without the um, energy shell, so you can just draw the electrons like so. And you may, may see it without the circles, and you can do the same for methane. But this is the covalent bond here, where they're sharing electrons. So chlorine is in group 7. You can say each individual chlorine atom has 7 electrons. So this one has 7 crosses. And this one has 7 dots to represent the electrons. And because they both need one electron, instead they will share a pair of electrons. And if you look at each individual atom now, they will have 8. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And this one... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, by that share pair. Here, in the same way, hydrogen only ever had one electron, and carbon has four electrons. So you can see, just by sharing the electrons here, hydrogen is now complete, because it has two electrons in its shell, and that is full, because it only has the inner shell. And if we look at each, uh, if we look at the carbon atom, 
that has eight electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, giving that a complete shell. So you may well have to complete diagrams to show covalent bonding. A little tip is to think about how many electrons they need to complete their outer shell, and that will know how many pairs of electrons the atoms will need to share. So oxygen is in group six. If it's in group six, that means each atom has six electrons on the outer shell, and they need two more. So because they need two, that's your hint that this is going to have this time two shared pairs of electrons. So I'd start there. So draw one atom with dots and one atom with crosses to make it nice and clear. So we start with our two pairs of shared electrons in the middle. And now we know that we've used two electrons up for each atom. And because they started with six, they can only have four more. So if I make this one the one with dots, I will put four more electrons, doesn't matter where you put them, around the outside. This one here, I will put four crosses around the outside. So in total, if we look at this oxygen atom here, it only has its one, two, three, four, five, six crosses that it started with. However, in total, it now has eight electrons because it's sharing some with the other oxygen atom. And this one, it only has the six that it started off with. But again, if you look at it, it has eight electrons because it now has this double covalent bond. So we would draw a double covalent bond with two lines, like show, to show the oxygen atoms bonding together. Nitrogen then is in group five. So this needs three extra electrons for a complete shell. So that's where we start. We start with three shared pairs of electrons. And this time it will only have two more on the outer shell like that. So if we look at this nitrogen atom, it has five crosses because it was in group five. But now as a complete atom here, it has eight because of these um, electrons here, you've got six here, seven, eight, and the same for this one. So this is now a triple covalent bond, which we would draw with nitrogen, with three triple covalent, with three covalent bonds, sorry, to another nitrogen atom. So the structure and properties of covalent um, molecules are very different to ionic bonding that we looked at before. They don't form giant structures anymore. Um, you will literally see the oxygen molecule going around as one molecule, O2, and the nitrogen going around as N2. They don't form giant structures. So they are simple, small molecules. They are joined together by strong covalent bonds. And they have weak intermolecular forces between the molecules. What that means is the covalent bond between the atoms, so here this double covalent bond is very strong, it's very difficult to split these oxygen atoms apart. However, if you had two oxygen molecules close together, they have what we call intermolecular forces, so forces between the molecules, and these are very weak. So the bond here is very strong, and the bond here is very strong, but these intermolecular forces, which exist between the molecules, are very weak. And having weak intermolecular forces means that they have particular properties, including this time a low boiling point and melting point. So many of these simple small molecules are gas at room temperature. Not all of them, but many are gas at room temp. And also, because these particles are not charged in any way, they do not conduct electricity. In rare cases, covalent bonding can also lead to giant structures. And there's three giant covalent structures in particular that you need to be aware of. 
and these are diamond, graphite, and silicon dioxide, or you may well see that written as silica. So with these giant covalent structures, they still have very strong covalent bonds. They are giant structures, lattice structures, and this gives them very particular properties. Unlike the small simple molecules, these giant covalent uh, molecules actually have very high melting and boiling points. And as a rule, they generally don't conduct electricity. Except graphite, and we'll explain why that does so in just a sec. So a little bit more detail for diamond and graphite that you need to be aware of. Um, let's go into the elements first of all. You can see these are just made from one type of element. These are both made out of carbon, whereas silicon dioxide is made out of silicon and oxygen. So with the carbon structures here, we can describe these as allotropes of carbon. This means they are different structural forms of the same element. So these are both made out of carbon, but they're very um, structurally different and therefore they have slightly different properties to each other. With diamond, each carbon makes four covalent bonds with other carbon atoms. So carbon's in group four, it has four electrons in its outer shell, and it makes four strong covalent bonds. It uses all the electrons that it has. However, with graphite, graphite, it only makes three covalent bonds with each of its carbons. Therefore, it has a spare electron on each of its carbon atoms, which is delocalized. It's allowed to move throughout the structure. This delocalized electron gives uh, this delocalized electron, sorry, gives it a very particular property in that it can conduct electricity. So. Graphite only makes three um, carbon bonds with each of its carbon, therefore it has a delocalized electron, and therefore it's free to move throughout the structure and it can conduct electricity. Because diamond has four bonds, it is a very strong structure. And it is a very hard material, one, one of the uh, hardest materials on our planet. Graphite, however, forms layers, and you can talk about that when you're talking about the structure. It has weak forces of attraction between the layers. And that means the layers can slide quite easily, and it is quite soft. Graphite is the... Um, substance used in pencils. So you, as you use a pencil, you're literally taking layers of graphite from the inside of your pencil. With graphite, if you took off just a single layer from the top, we call that graphene. So a single layer of graphite is called graphene. And that is very, very light because it's just a single layer, but it's still a very strong structure because of these covalent bonds. So graphene is something that's being used in new technologies um, to strengthen materials without adding much weight. A final molecule that involves covalent bonds are polymers. You can see here, we said before that straight lines between non-metals represent covalent bonds. So you can see this polymer is made through covalent bonding. But with this polymer, you can see that we've only drawn a small section of it. And this is the repeating unit that repeats again and again and again. So if we draw it as a square, that would be joined to another one and another one and another one and so on until we got a really, really long chain polymer. 
Hence this n here, that just means any number. So this can be any number of units long. If we were to write this out, which you might be asked to do in the exam, the formula for the polymer, you need to count up the number of carbons. So there's three, so C3. Count up the number of H's. There's three, four, five, six. So six hydrogens. And you would write that in brackets with the N outside. And that would be our formula for the polymer. Most polymers then are solid at room temperature. And whereas we said with the simple molecules that there were weak intermolecular forces, with polymers, if we had two polymer strands, for example, like here, the forces between the molecules, the inter intermolecular forces, are a lot larger. And that, therefore, gives them a much higher melting point and boiling point than simple molecules. Hence why a lot of them are solid at room temperature compared to a gas, but they've still got much lower than something like an ionic bond or a covalent bonded, covalently bonded structure. So larger intermolecular forces between the polymers giving them a higher melting point and boiling point. The final type of bonding that you need to be aware of is metallic bonding. And that's the bonding that exists between metal atoms. For example, if you were to pick up a large lump of gold, there would be metallic bonding within the, between the gold atoms to make sure that that structure stays together. And this model here shows what metallic bonding looks like. It's represented by the positive metal ions. And with metals, the outer electrons are actually free to move around. So we say that they are surrounded by what we describe as a sea of delocalized electrons. So if we were to draw electrons in here, we'd have the positive ions there, and the electrons would be moving all around in all around the structure. And that gives it a very particular property that we know about with metals in that they are very good conductors of heat and electricity. They also have very high melting and boiling points. You should know this because you can appreciate the amount of energy that it would take to heat and melt a metal. So you should remember that they have high melting and boiling points. And you should already know that most of them are solid at room temperature. General properties of metals then, they are also very strong and malleable, meaning they can be bent and hammered into shape. That's what malleable means. So when you're asked about the structure in the exam, you need to be talking about this part, the sea of delocalized de electrons and the positive metal ions in a regular structure, the fact that it forms a giant structure, and the properties, conductors of heat, electricity, the melting and boiling points, and the fact they are strong and malleable. So with metals, there's two um, different types that we use regularly. There are pure metals. The thing with pure metals, though, is they're actually quite soft because the metal atoms or the metal ions are arranged in layers. And those layers can slide over each other easily. Meaning that you can move the atoms around, you can shape the object and it's quite soft. However, to make metals a lot harder, we can make them into an alloy, and an alloy is a mixture of metals. So you can see here that you've got different sized metal atoms. And this means that the layers are now distorted, so the atoms are not in regular layers. And what that means is the atoms can't slide over it easily in an alloy. 
So this structure makes them a lot harder. And this is a really common question in the exam. So either they'll ask you about the pure metals and simply you need to write about the atoms being in layers and being able to slide easily, or they'll show you a diagram of an alloy or maybe ask you to draw a diagram of an alloy. And we need the fact that it's now got different sized atoms, distorted layers or the atoms aren't in regular layers and the fact that the atoms now can't slide easily over each other and it makes a much harder substance. We've already covered part of this topic in the previous section about carbon being in diamond and graphite, so this extra bit in this topic is about fullerenes. Some very special covalently bonded structures now are the fullerenes. These are other examples of allotropes of carbon, so they're all made out of carbon but they have different structures. This here and this here are examples of fullerenes. So this is a molecule that is spherical. It has the structure C60 because it is made out of 60 carbons and it mostly is formed by hexagons. There are also some pentagons and other shapes in there as well, but it's mostly formed out of hexagons to give it a spherical structure. And this is called Buckminster fullerene. So because it's of its spherical shape, it is a useful lubricant. Having this shape, it also has a large surface area, which makes it useful for a catalyst. And what this Buckminster fullerene is being developed and used for is for um, drug delivery into the body. As you can see, it, it looks like a, a bit of a cage, and that's exactly how they're trying to use it. So they're trying to put drugs into inside the sphere of the Buckminster fullerene and use that to deliver the drug to a particular place in the body. But further to that, like we said, it is also a useful lubricant because it's got a spherical shape. It can roll around, reducing the friction of components in a machine. And it also is a useful catalyst because of its surface area as well. The other structure that we have here is another type of fullerene and this one forms a tube and it's called a nanotube. Again, made of carbon. So this looks quite similar to graphite, however it's rolled around into one tube rather than consisting of layers. These nanotubes um, are being used in electrical components because they can conduct electricity and they can conduct heat as well. So that makes them quite useful for electronics. They also ha are extremely strong, but extremely light at the same time. So these nanotubes have been used to reinforce structures such as tennis rackets, giving the advantage of being particularly strong and making the, the racket structure strong. But at the same time with the tennis racket, you don't want it to be too heavy. You want it to be nice and light. So it adds to the strength of material without contributing a great deal to its weight. Here are the three equations for the higher tier paper that I recommend you write down and learn off by heart. And then when you get into the exam, you can brain dump them, which means write them down straight away on the first bit of white paper that you see, so you don't forget them. Moles in chemistry is a word to describe a particular number of particles. And that number of particles comes from Avogadro's constant, which is a very particular number of particles, 6.02 times 10 to the 23 particles. So one mole of a substance will contain 6.02 times 10 to the 23. It's just like using the word dozen to represent 12. We would say we have a dozen toy cars, for example, rather than saying we have 12 cars. Or rather than saying we have 6.02 times 10 to the 23 atoms of carbon, we shorten that by saying we have one mole of carbon. 
The mole is represented by the large numbers in front of chemicals in an equation. For example, this equation here we can write out in terms of moles and you may be able to, you may be asked to do this in the exam. So here we would describe this as two moles of hydrochloric acid reacting with one mole of calcium carbonate to produce one mole of calcium chloride, one mole of water and one mole of carbon dioxide. So this is what the large number is representing, the ratio of moles that you have in the equation. Moles relate to relative formula mass in an equation that we'll talk about on the next slide. However, quite simply, the relative formula mass in grams is how much one mole weighs. For example, the relative formula mass of calcium carbonate from the previous slide we worked out as 100. So it has a relative formula mass of 100, so 1 mole of calcium carbonate would equal 100 grams. Whereas water, we said, has a relative formula mass of 18, so 1 mole of water would weigh 18 grams. Or if we talk about it in terms of the number of particles, we're saying 1 mole, so 6.02 times 10 to the 23 particles of calcium carbonate would weigh 100 grams, or 1 mole, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 particles of water, would weigh 18 grams. This equation here is one that you're definitely going to have to remember and I would highly recommend you writing that down as soon as you get started in your exam. Just turn over the first page and then a piece of blank space write down moles equals mass divided by mR because it's likely that you will need that in your exam. So questions um, such as this, how many moles are there in 16 grams of carbon dioxide? Well. If moles equals mass divided by mR, we would need to work out the relative formula mass of carbon dioxide. Using our periodic table, the mass of carbon is 12 and the mass of oxygen is 16. So 16 times 2, because there are two oxygen atoms in there, will give you a relative formula mass of 44. So how many moles are there? Well, moles equals mass divided by mR, so 16 divided by 44 would give you the answer of 0.36 moles. Second question, how many moles are there in 2 grams of calcium carbonate? Well the relative formula mass of calcium carbonate, if you were to work that out, is 100 because we've got 40 added to 12 added to 3 lots of 16. So moles equals 2 divided by 100, which would give the answer of 0 0.02 moles. And concentration is mass over volume. Now, concentration is measured in grams per decimeters cubed. That means the mass must be in grams and the volume must be in decimeters cubed. What they'll do is sometimes trick you out by giving you the mass in kilograms okay in which you need to because it's kilo times 10 to the 3 or times by a thousand to get it into grams and the volume they give it to you in centimeters cubed get yourself an easy mark if you see centimeters cubed divide it by a thousand to turn it into decimeters cubed so let's look at this one it says what's the concentration of a sodium chloride solution made from two grams, that's the mass, of sodium chloride dissolved in, there's your banana skin, 200 centimeters cubed of water. They're trying to make you slip up. So that's the volume, but we need to divide that by a thousand to turn it into decimeters cubed. So we get 0 0.2 decimeters cubed. So that gives us one mark, and we then put our numbers in the equation. So the concentration is what we want. So concentration equals mass 2 divided by volume. 
0.2, which gives us an answer of 10 grams per decimeters cubed. Now, you may be asked to rearrange it as well. So if you notice that they're asking you to calculate mass or volume, you're going to have to rearrange it. Same as before, but this time you also have the equation concentration equals moles over volume. So this question says, what's the concentration of sodium chloride solution made from 0.4 moles of sodium chloride dissolved in banana skin, 500 centimeters cubed of water? Banana skin, because it's wanting you to divide by 1,000. This will be your first mark to give you 0.5 decimeters cubed. So then moles over volume would give you 0.4 over 0.5, which is 0.8 moles per decimeters cubed. Now, if you're wanting moles per decimeters cubed, but then you need your answer in grams per decimeters cubed, the decimeters cubed bit is staying the same. So you need to think how you convert moles to grams. So then you use the equation moles equals mass over MR. So moles would equal the mass over MR. So if we want to get from moles to mass, we would need to multiply by the relative formula mass. Okay, rearrange that mass equals moles times MR. So we'd have 0 0.8 from before multiplied by the relative formula mass of sodium chloride, which they've given you here, to give you 46.8 grams per decimeters cubed. So this is a case where they've asked you, look at the units carefully for grams per decimeters cubed and not moles per decimeters cubed. Could be four marks or so for that question. I want to run through balancing equations using masses. For these ones, you get the marks for the working out and not for just balancing equations. So they give you masses and they give you relative atomic masses. So think to yourself straight away, moles equals mass over MR. So 19.5 is, is the mass. I've just written out again here. If you take the question and write it out as an equation, it will help you. So then we divide by the relative atomic mass. So for just K, it will just be um, 39 because there's only one thing. 9 grams here, H2O would be two lots of H plus one lot of O, which is 18. K plus O plus H would be 56 for a relative formula mass. And then H2 is two. If you do that, you will get a ratio of 0.5 to 0.5 to 0.5 to 0.25. So we're nearly there to balancing our equation, but it can't have decimals in. So if you divide everything by the smallest one, That will give us a ratio of 2 to 2 to 2 to 1. And the final thing, don't miss out the step, is you have to write the balanced equation. So for this one, you get marks for your working out and not for simply writing this final answer at the end. So you'll know if you got it right, if the equation balances properly, but this is where you get your marks using the moles equation. Because this equation is showing us the ratio of moles that are reacting 2 to 2 to 2 to 1. Let's calculate the mass of sodium chloride produced when 2 tonnes of sodium carbonate reacts with hydrochloric acid. So we want um, 2 tonnes. If I just, I always write it under here, it just helps me out. So 2 tonnes of sodium carbonate reacting with hydrochloric acid and how much sodium chloride do we need to make? What we need to find out could well be on this side of the equation as well, it doesn't matter. But everything else, just put a cross through because you don't need to worry about that. So I recommend you doing the moles mass MR in a grid for each thing. So moles mass MR in a grid, moles mass MR. So write down the information that you know. Now, really, you should convert these to grams, um, but I'm just going to keep it as the tons because it all work out the same in the end. Um, so I'm going to put down here two tons for the mass of 
um, sodium carbonate that I've got. And then using my periodic table, I would need to work out the relative formula mass. Again, they might give you those numbers, but I'll tell you now that the relative formula mass of this is 106. The relative formula mass of sodium chloride, don't include the two, okay? Ignore that because we'll use that later. Think to yourself, I'll use that later, so I'll ignore that, is 58.5. So the one thing that I can work out, that's everything that I've got, first of all, the one thing I can work out is this bit, the moles. So moles equals mass over MR, so 2 divided by 106 will give us 0 0.01887. This is where these numbers come important, the ratio of moles. The ratio of moles here is one sodium carbonate to two sodium chloride. So when we convert the moles over here, we need to double up because we've got a ratio of one to two. So doubling this will give us 0 0.0377 moles. And then we re rearrange our formula moles equals mass over MR. If we re rearrange that to MR times moles equals mass, we know to multiply these two together to get our answer of 2.2 tons. Now you could have done it in grams and then converted it back into tons, that's fine as well. Now I would recommend converting these ones to grams first of all because in last year you were Dr Mark if you didn't do a limiting reactant question in grams. So first of all I would recommend you converting these, don't forget kilo is times 10 to the 3 so it's timesing it by 1000 so you'd have 20,000 and you'd have 50,000. So it's saying when you react these two together, ignoring this side, when you react these two things together one is a limiting reactant. That will mean that it will all be used up. And the other one, you add in excess. Okay, so the limiting reactant is the one that's used up. So they should react in a ratio of two moles to two moles. So let's have a look what we've got then. Again, moles equals mass over MR equation. So moles equals mass over MR. So to calculate the number of moles that we've actually reacted together, we do our 20,000 divided by 23, ignoring the 2, because we talk about this later, and then the 50,000 divided by the relative formula mass of these two, which is 36.5. So we get an answer of 869.565 moles, reacting with 1369 0.86 moles and we need to find out which one we've added too much of now because they're the same ratio you might have worked that out already but if it's more difficult if you divide both sides by the smallest one so in this case divide it by 869.565 you will get a ratio of 1 to 1.575 so you know that the ratio should be 2 to 2 which we'd simplify to 1 to 1 okay so this one here is the limiting reactant, okay, because we've reacted one mole. Now, if we had one mole, we should have reacted one mole over here, but we didn't. We added 1.575 as our ratio, so this one we've added in excess. When you do your conclusion, write about the moles that actually reacted, so write about this bit. And you would say the limiting reactant is sodium because 869.56 moles were all used up, whereas the hydrochloric acid was added in excess because only 869.565 was needed because the ratio was 1 to 1 and 1369.86 was actually added. So conclude in a sentence using the moles that you'd worked out here. Right then, my final bit of advice if you're doing higher tier is if you see f maybe four if they're harsh, but definitely five or six mark questions, you may need to combine more than one equation. So you brain dump them and work out which equations to use. It's not many. Moles equals mass over MR. Concentration equals mass over volume. And concentration equals moles over volume. 
Last little bit, remember, centimetres cubed, divide, divide by a thousand to get to decimetres cubed. And you might need to use these. For example, let's say you needed to work out concentration by mass over volume. You may well need to work out the mass first by rearranging this and doing moles times MR. Or if you wanted to work out moles over volume, you may well need to do the mass divided by relative formula mass first and then put it into this equation. First of all, we'll talk about neutralisation. And the general equation for neutralisation is when an acid reacts with a base to make a salt plus water. Now this base can either be insoluble, so something like calcium oxide where you'd have a powder that you'd add to your acid, or it can be soluble, something like sodium hydroxide, where you would have a liquid or a solution that you react with the acid. And soluble bases have another very special name called alkali. So if you see an alkali reacting with an acid, you know that that is a soluble base or a solution that you're using. When you react an alkali with an acid, you can use an indicator like universal indicator or a, a piece of equipment like a pH probe instead, which is an electrical piece of equipment that will give you an exact number. Um, because the universal indicator links with the pH scale. So this here is the pH scale. It goes from 1 to 14. Number 7 in the middle, pH 7, is for a neutral substance, for example, water. So sometimes you have a, a pH 0 as well on the end here. The range 0 to 6 are your acids, so the range 0 to 6. And within the range 8 to 14 are your alkalis, 8 to 14. Now acids... Um, are solutions that have hydrogen ions in them, whereas alkalis have the ion hydroxide in them. So I'll just write that hydroxide out. Hydroxide ions for an alkali and hydrogen ions for an acid. Now with the neutralisation reaction, you're taking an acid and you're reacting it with a base to make a salt plus water. So if you're making uh, an acid with hydrogen ions, react with an alkali with hydroxide ions, you can see that the result of those two reaction, reacting are going to make water. And also, you'll make a salt in the reaction as well. But this is the ionic equation for neutralisation. So using the pH scale, we can describe acids that are far away from neutral as strong acids and the ones that are closer as weaker acids. In the same way with alkalis, the closer you are to, to water and to neutrality, the weaker you are and the, str the further away you are, there's your strong alkalis at the end. This section on strong and weak acids is for higher tier pupils only. This section on uh, strong and weak acids links again to the pH scale. So just in a little bit more detail, pH is a measure of the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution. So we said before that here with our 0, our 1, these are our strong acids and here are our weak acids. When you go down a number on the pH scale, you increase the number of hydrogen ions in your solution by a factor of 10. So that's something to be be aware of they might give you a certain number of hydrogen ions that are in a um, pH 6 solution and perhaps ask you how many would be in a pH 2 solution you have to keep multiplying by 10 until you get to the right 
pH. So they de increase by a factor of each 10 as the pH decreases. But the words strong and weak acids also refer to particular types of acid. Strong ones are the ones that you are probably used to using in your lab. So for example, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, and nitric acid. Note that they all start with H because they're all producing hydrogen ions. When they dissolve in solution, strong acids completely ionize in water. What ionizing means in this case is they completely break down into their two ions. For example, hydrochloric acid would completely ionize into H plus ions and chloride ions when it is dissolved in water. Whereas weak acids are things such as citric acid, carboxylic acids like ethanoic acid, and with these weak acids they only partially ionise in water. Partially ionising means that if you have, for example, ethanoic acid, which is CH3COOH, when that breaks down in water, it's actually a reversible reaction. You do get hydrogen ions and um, the negative part of the ion as well, CH3COO minus. So it does break down and form hydrogen ions, but because it's reversible, these form again to produce ethanoic acid. So you get fewer hydrogen ions in solution. So in this case, you get more hydrogen ions, whereas with a weak acid, you get fewer hydrogen ions. And this will, of course, relate then to their pH on the pH scale. The more hydrogen ions that you've got, the stronger the acid, the fewer hyd hydrogen ions, the weaker the acid. So this makes um, these strong acids more reactive as well because there are more hydrogen ions in there that can then react but also we can look at them in terms of the difference between strength and concentration because we could have two bottles of acid with the same concentration hydrochloric and ethanoic acid and we can both for example have the concentration of one molar. They've got the same um, amount in grams dissolved per volume. Remember those units from concentration. Um, so they've got the same amount of acid dissolved in solution. However, because this one will be completely ionizing in water, producing lots of hydrogen ions, this will be a stronger acid with a lower pH. Whereas this ethanoic acid here will only partially ionise in water, so it will be a weaker acid with a higher pH. There are several chemical reactions that you need to know of as part of this topic. The first one that we'll look at is reactions with metals and water. So when metals react with water, they will produce a metal hydroxide and hydrogen gas. So potassium and water would make potassium hydroxide plus hydrogen. If you remember from when we looked at the periodic table, um, potassium will actually um, float on top of the water and perhaps will spark and flame as well because it's a reactive group one alkali metal. But this will work with any metal that will be able to react with water. So for example, you might have magnesium reacting with water and this time you'll produce magnesium hydroxide plus hydrogen. Some metals are not reactive enough to react with water like copper so you wouldn't be able to write an equation for that but anything that reacts with water you can. For the next reactions um, many of them will produce something called a salt so let's talk about how we name salts first of all. We name salts in two parts. They have one part that 
is the metal that's in the salt and the second part will depend on the acid. So there's three acids that you need to know about in particular. Sulfuric acid makes a sulfate salt. Nitric acid makes a nitrate salt. And hydrochloric acid makes a chloride salt. Okay, so those three we really need to remember because then we'll be able to name all of the salts in this exam. So this is an example of our first reaction that's going to produce a salt plus hydrogen. So if you put a metal in with an acid, you'll produce a salt plus hydrogen. Naming the salts then, we've got the metal iron, and this time we're reacting with hydrochloric acid. So following our rules, we'll make iron chloride plus hydrogen. Here we've got iron and sulfuric acid reaction, reacting, so we make iron sulfate this time, plus hydrogen. And finally we've got nitric acid this time, so we make iron nitrate plus hydrogen. If we change the metal, for example if this was magnesium, instead we'd make magnesium chloride and hydrogen and so on. In this reaction we are reacting acid with a metal oxide this time, so before we were just reacting it with a metal and producing hydrogen. Now we've got oxygen in there, we're producing water instead, so we're producing a salt plus water. So nitric acid and sodium oxide, there's the metal, sodium, and we're, used to, and we're using nitric acid, so we're going to make the salt sodium nitrate. And our second product is going to be water. It's very, very similar. And um, we've got a metal hydroxide here. So whereas this was sodium oxide, which is Na2O, this time we've got um, a metal hydroxide, which in this case is iron hydroxide, which is FeOH. Two. So it's the OH hydroxide we've got now, but same way it produces a salt plus water. So this time the metal is iron and we're using sulfuric acid, so we make iron sulfate plus water. In this reaction we've got now a metal carbonate, and if you see the word carbon you must think to yourself that this reaction also produces carbon dioxide. So you've got hydrochloric acid plus zinc carbonate and you're going to produce a salt plus water plus carbon dioxide. So let's name the salt first of all. The metal is zinc and the acid is hydrochloric. So we will make zinc chloride and then we will make water and because it's a carbonate we will also make carbon dioxide. Two further reactions, we've got oxidation and reduction. In terms of a chemical reaction, oxidation means the gain of oxygen and reduction means the loss of oxygen. You also see these two words later on in terms of electrons and they mean something different, but for the moment we're talking about a chemical reaction. So in this one, zinc reacts with oxygen and zinc gains oxygen, so it forms zinc oxide. And in terms of reduction this time, it means the loss of oxygen. So this time, zinc oxide would lose its oxygen. So you'd make zinc plus carbon dioxide. We'll now talk about the required practical, which is all about making a salt. So to make a salt, we're going to do a neutralisation reaction. So we've got our base reacting with our acid to make a salt plus water. In this case, we've got copper oxide reacting with hydrochloric acid to produce copper chloride salt and water. You could use sulfuric acid to make copper sulfate, but it all depends on what salt that you want to make at the end of the process. So this copper oxide, you can see by the state symbol, is solid, it's insoluble, and it is a, a black powder. 
that will react with acid and make a soluble salt. You can tell by this state symbol of AQ, which means for, that means aqueous, that that is soluble and it's going to be dissolved in water. So to start off with, to make our salt, we need to add the copper oxide in excess to the acid. Really important term, it means we keep adding it until no more reacts. So we have our acid in our beaker, a certain amount, say 30 mils that we would measure with our uh, measuring cylinder, and then we keep adding that copper oxide in excess until we see the copper oxide at the bottom of the beaker to show that no more can react. We now need to get rid of that because if we were just to heat that we wouldn't end up with our pure crystals, we'd end up with some copper oxide on top as well. So the first process is filtration, we'd pour um, that reaction into our filter paper with inside our funnel and in the conical flask we would collect our solution containing our salt and our water and at the top here we would have our excess copper oxide collected and filtered out. The next process is to then get rid of the water because we just want the salt on its own. So the next process is called crystallization and you can either use a Bunsen burner to heat up an evaporating dish over a tripod. Um, sometimes you might choose to heat it up more slowly in a water bath or using an electric heater. You might see any of those heating methods in the exam. But we put our solution into there and our water will evaporate. And that will leave us, after a while, we might take it off the heat and leave it to finish evaporating off the heat, but we will end up with crystals left in our evaporating dish where we've actually extracted our salt crystals. So you need to be able to describe this method and say each step by step what you need to do to create your soluble salt. You may see in the exam that to, um, to help the insoluble base react with the acid, you may see this acid heated over a Bunsen, just gently, just to warm it up a little bit before this is added, but obviously that's going to have safety um, precautions associated with it because you're heating acid and you don't want that spitting out of the um, beaker. Also here when you're heating the crystals this must be very gentle heat otherwise they can end up drying out too quickly and spitting at you as well. Now we're going to look at the reactivity series. The reactivity series is how we list metals in order of their reactivity. So here we've got potassium which is most reactive and then copper which is least reactive. Copper is really useful because it doesn't react with many things, it doesn't react with water, so you can use it as water pipes um, and things like that. Also, not on this list, but you'll find substances such as gold, they're completely unreactive, um, which we'll talk about later when we're talking about extracting metals. Within that list as well, you'll also have two non-metals, you'll have carbon and hydrogen that you need to be aware of. Again, important for metal extraction a little bit later on. You may well be asked to um, have a look at some examples of experiments and work out the order of reactivity. For example, if we had some potassium in this conical flask over here, this would react with water quite vigorously. In fact, potassium would float on top of the water because it's got a low density from group one and it would react vigorously, perhaps producing a flame as well and fizzing around on top of the water producing lots of hydrogen gas. That would show that that was really reactive. You might then have something like magnesium which you would put in another conical flask. Again that would fizz quite a lot producing a fair amount of gas but not as much as the potassium and then finally you might have something like iron 
that would give fewer bubbles of gas and would obviously be less reactive. So you might have to have a look at descriptions of experiments and then work out their order of reactivity. Linking into the reactivity series then, um, we're going to talk about how we can extract metals by the process of reduction, which is a chemical reaction we talked about earlier, which re involves removing oxygen. So here we've got the reactivity series again, and this is important to understand what methods we can use to extract metals. Now apart from metals such as gold, which are completely unreactive, and can be found naturally. You can sieve for gold in the river and it won't have reacted with anything else. It's just um, found in its natural state. All the other ones tend to react with things like oxygen and form a rock, which we call an ore. So this is a rock which contains metals. For example, this rock could be iron oxide. But when coming to extract metals we need to take that iron oxide and actually take the iron out of that rock and there might be other impurities in there as well. There may, be, may well be sulfur and carbon in the rock and things like that. Now with iron as well as zinc and copper one way we can do this is by a process of reduction. And this can only happen with anything that is below carbon on the reactivity series. So we can't do reduction with potassium, sodium, lithium, calcium or magnesium because they themselves are more reactive than carbon. This is an example. Let's use iron as an example. If we have our ore, which is iron oxide, and we want to extract the iron, we would heat it up with carbon and that would then produce iron and carbon dioxide which is the reduction reaction that we looked at in the, when we looked at chemical reactions. It's called reduction because you are removing the oxygen from the ore. If you were to do this with Magnesium oxide, nothing would happen because the carbon is not reactive enough to take away that oxygen. So this only happens for metals that are less reactive than carbon. So for example here, you might see in the exam them talk about a blast furnace where they may do this kind of reduction reaction. So in here they would put your iron oxide and your carbon and you'd need hot air going in here. And out at the bottom, you'd end up with your molten iron and any impurities also come out of the bottom. It's a substance called slag, which comes out the bottom. And any of your waste gases will come out the top. So your carbon dioxide and so on will come out the top. Redox reactions is a topic for higher tier pupils only. Again, it involves the two words oxidation meaning the loss of electrons and reduction meaning the gain of electrons and what you need to be able to do is understand in a formula like this where you have atoms and when where you have ions if the element is on its own that is an atom if it's bonded in a compound with a non-metal that makes the metal an ion. So copper is an ion there, whereas iron is an atom. Iron here is an ion, whereas copper is an atom. So in this case, we've got iron that is turned from an atom to an ion, where it would go into Fe2+. And we've got copper, which is turned from an an ion, Cu2+, to an atom, which is just Cu. So in this case, the iron atom would have lost electrons, and therefore that would have been oxidised, because oxidation is the loss of electrons. 
and the copper would have gained electrons to turn back into a copper atom and therefore the copper would have been reduced. So they might say to you which species, meaning which chemical in a chemistry sense, has been reduced or which species has been oxidised in this equation. And you need to look at which ones are turning from atoms to ions and which ones are turning from ions to atoms. These equations are called redox because you have something that is being reduced and something that is being oxidised in the same reaction. Ionic equations are for higher tier pupils only. So when you see a neutralisation reaction like this, you can actually write it as a simpler ionic equation, which only involves um, the elements that are changing from ions into atoms or vice versa. So in this equation above, because it's a neutralisation reaction and it's producing water, one trick to remember is when it's neutralisation, the ionic equation is always going to be the same. Hydrogen reacting with hydroxide ions to produce water. Everything else are spectator, atom, uh, spectator ions. For example, to show you here, chlor the chloride ion here is still a chloride ion on this side of the equation. That hasn't changed. The sodium ion here is still a sodium ion on this side of the equation. So they're both spectator ions that can be taken out. However, you've got here a hydrogen ion and a hydroxide ion that then bond together as a molecule of water. So what we're doing is get, getting rid of the ions that are staying the same and writing out in its simpler form to show the ions that are changing and reacting. So the ionic equation for any neutralization reaction is going to be the same. Hydrogen ions plus hydroxide makes water. You can also write ionic equations for displacement reactions and other reactions in the topic. But let's have a look at displacement. We'll look at the elements that are changing between ions and atoms. So in this case we've got a magnesium atom and now it's bonded, it's now an ion, so that's going to be changing. We've got a zinc ion which is changing into a zinc atom but the chloride ions are staying the same. They're bonded this side, they're an ion, they're bonded that side. So they're spectator ions that can be removed. And we can write an ion equation which shows magnesium atoms react with zinc ions. Zinc is Zn2+. Plus, and they will produce magnesium ions, Mg2+, plus, and zinc. And one more example here, you've got iron atoms that turn into ions and copper ions that turn into atoms. The sulfate ion, we don't need to worry about because it's a spectator ion, it stays an ion both sides. So our ionic equation getting rid of the spectator ions would be iron atoms add copper ions producing iron ions and copper atoms. The separate only topics for topic four are the titration required practical and the titration calculations for higher tier only that go along with that. So this is the type of question that you will be able to work out using a titration. It says how much alkali do I need to neutralize 50 centimeters cubed of 0.1 mole per decimeters cubed sulfuric acid. So this is the volume that we have and this is the concentration. So we start off with our sulfuric acid uh, and it's of known concentration. We know this is 0.1 moles per decimeters cubed. So we're going to use 50 centimeters cubed of this and this is where our pipette comes in and our pipette can accurately, accurately measure a known volume. So we will use a pipette holder, which will be like a rubber ball on top to help draw up the liquid. We would put this pipette in our acid and draw up as much as we needed. So this one's a 25 mil one, so we'd need two of these all together, but you get the idea. 
50 mils in here because this is what we said we're using 50 centimeters cubed of acid into that we need to add an indicator and this is where our phenolphthalein indicator comes in phenolphthalein um, is a good indicator because it has a very specific end point you can't use universal indicator because that has a really wide range of colors that it goes through whereas phenolphthalein has a specific end point in acid it will start off colorless in acid and then it will go pink when it's neutralized okay so this one here as we start it we add a few drops of phenolphthalein and then it starts off as colorless we then need to start using this piece of equipment which is attached to a clamp stand and this is our burette. Into our burette we put our alkali and we fill it right up to the top. If we zoomed that up, the top of the burette would have a zero on it and as we fill the burette with our alkali we need to get the bottom of the liquid line touching the zero. This is called our meniscus. So we'd keep adding the liquid until our meniscus reached the zero line. What we then do is open up our tap here and drop by drop we would add our acid, our alkali into our acid. So we'd add alkali into the acid and we would swirl it. And this is a very gradual process but what we're looking for is a colour change. To help us out we would often put a white tile under here just so that the colour change is really really obvious. So you might see that on your equipment list, a white tile. And gradually if we're uh, dripping into there and swirling this will change from colourless to pink and we can stop and measure the volume of alkali needed to neutralise that amount of acid. For higher tier only then we need to take these um, measurements of volume that we've taken from the titration and we can then use that to work out the, cal the concentration of the alkali. So if in the previous experiment we worked out that we needed 110 centimetres cubed of sodium hydroxide to neutralise our 50 centimetres cubed of sulfuric acid, then we can calculate the concentration of sodium hydroxide. We need to remember another equation to be able to do this and that is moles equals concentration multiplied by volume. So what I recommend you do is have a look at your equation and first of all make sure it's balanced because we need it to be balanced to work out the ratio of moles in just a minute. And we need this side of the equation. I always draw a little table so you can have your alkali and your acid and write down the three components that you need to work out the moles, the concentration and the volume for each one and write those in the same order. Then first of all extract from the information they've given you in the question everything that you can and add it to your table. So we've got a volume for sodium hydroxide or alkali, we've got a volume for acid and we've got a concentration for acid. Now the volume is really important because they will try and trip you up by giving you the volume in centimetres cubed. You must convert that to decimetres cubed by dividing by a thousand. So I tend to write it in my table like that so I don't forget. So the alkali volume would be 110 divided by a thousand and the acid volume would be 50 divided by a thousand. For the concentration of the acid, we know that as 0.1 and the concentration of the alkali, I always put as a question mark because that's what we want to work out. So using the calculation up here, because we've got two components here, so that should be a 5, it doesn't look like a 5, we've got two components here, we can calculate the moles by doing concentration multiplied by volume and if we did that, we would have the number of moles as 0 0.0. 0, 5. This is where the balanced equation comes in. You need to look at the ratio of moles in the equation. You can see that the ratio is 2 lots of alkali to 1 lot of acid. So the ratio of alkali 
to acid is 2 to 1. If it was 1 to 1, so there was no 2 here, we could just write the same number of moles over on this side, 0 0.005, but because it's double the number of moles, we have to double the number of moles here. So the number of moles of the alkali would actually be 0 0.01 moles. And then finally, we can now work out our concentration by rearranging our equation to say concentration equals moles divided by volume. So we take our mole 0 0.01 and divide it by 110 divided by 1000, which is of course the same as 0 0.1. 1, 1. So if we do 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.11, we get a concentration of 0 0.09 grams per decimeters cubed, and that is our answer to our question. So I really recommend you drawing it out on the table with your moles concentration volume, remembering that the equation is balanced. And you must remember this equation here to be able to do these titration calculations. Another process in which you can extract metals is called electrolysis. Electrolysis uses electricity to split up compounds. So electrolysis uses electricity to split metal compounds. But the trouble is with electrolysis is it uses a lot of energy because the electricity needed and therefore it is very expensive. So with the metals that are below carbon in the reactivity series really you want to be using um, reduction because that's cheaper. However some metals such as aluminium you can't use reduction because they're more reactive than carbon so you would have to use electrolysis and it makes it a little bit more expensive. Let's take our basic example first of all and this links back to ionic bonding. So with our ore, let's say for example here we had lead bromide. Remember back from ionic bonding we've got a metal and a non-metal bonding together. So this comprises of ions, we've got our lead ion Pb2 plus and two bromide ions, Br minus, bonded together to make that compound. Now, if we were to stick two electrodes in there and link it up to a, a direct current supply, nothing would happen. Because in this um, state here, whilst it's solid, if you remember from um, ionic bonding, we've got a lattice structure of positive and negative ions throughout. But the trouble is, these ions can't move anywhere. But you can make this molten by heating it up. And when you do that, when you make it molten, those ions are then free to flow. So you, the bromide ions and the lead ions can then move around and conduct electricity because they are moving charges. This is not talking about electrons flowing in, in this um, liquid here. We are talking about ions that are free to flow. So please don't write electrons. Make sure you're talking about ions. This liquid here is called the electrolyte. And these are the two electrodes. You've got a positive electrode, otherwise known as the anode. But if you don't remember that, just write positive electrode. And the negative electrode, which is, is, which is the cathode. And this, as I'll show you later, is connected up to a, a DC supply. So in this simple case here, we've got our ore and we've heated it up so it is now molten and the ions are free to flow. Within here we've got positive ions. They will be attracted to the negative electrode and here we would have lead collecting around the negative electrode. And to the positive electrode you will have the bromide ions going and they will go off as bromine which is Br2 and you'll see the bromine gas given off at the electrode. In a second case here, I'm going to talk about the electrolysis of aluminium oxide. 
aluminium oxide has an extremely high melting point which would make this process very expensive. So what they do first of all is they dissolve it in something called cryolite and that then lowers the melting point so it takes less energy to heat it up and melt it and make it molten which in turn saves money and makes the aluminium cheaper. So in here we have a mixture of, well in this complete chamber in fact, we have a mixture of aluminium oxide and cryolite, that's our electrolyte, aluminium oxide and cryolite. And this time, you need to look at the diagram very carefully and they'll, get, they'll show you on the diagram, but this time they have three positive electrodes at the top. In there may be four, there may be five, there may be six, there may be more than that, doesn't matter on the number, but all of the ones going in at the top are now positive electrodes. And actually the negative electrode is the outside casing. So in here we have aluminium ions, Al3+, and oxide ions, 2 minus. The aluminium ions are positive, so they are attracted to the outside, and then they... Um, are tapped off at the bottom so here you get molten aluminium coming out of the bottom which you will then collect and use for whatever you want. At the top here you can see the positive um, electrodes and this is where the oxygen is attracted to so you get oxygen given off but also what happens is there's a really common question in the exam these electrodes are made out of graphite and if you remember, graphite is made up of one element, and that is carbon. So they often ask, why do these graphite electrodes gradually degrade and wear away? And the answer is, the oxygen that goes to these electrodes reacts with the carbon, producing carbon dioxide. So these gradually degrade because the oxygen reacts with the carbon di the carbon sorry to produce carbon dioxide so in this electrolysis you will also get carbon dioxide given off as the oxygen reacts with the electrodes and then they gradually need to be replaced over time there is also a required practical on electrolysis so be prepared to um, describe a method to set up electrolysis and also predict the results of the electrolysis. So for this we're going to be talking about electrolysis of aqueous solutions. That's when they are dissolved in water. So not only will you get a particular ionic compound but you'll also get the ions that are found in water. So you need to be able to draw a setup from scratch so you would need to draw a container and show electrodes going into that container connected to a, a power supply. When you draw the power supply, the long um, line of the cell would be the positive connected to the positive electrode and the shorter line to the negative electrode. And then you need to show your electrolyte solution covering the electrodes and you can label those up so you'd label the electrolyte which is the liquid that you're using your electrodes so your positive electrode or your anode your negative electrode and your DC supply it has to be direct current otherwise it won't work so let's say for for this example we are doing the electrolysis of sodium chloride solution. So with sodium chloride, if you were to split that up, you would have two ions, sodium and chlorine. But because it's in solution, it also means that you have the ions that are in water. So you would also have hydrogen ions and also hydroxide ions in that solution. And that poses a problem because you have negative ions, two of them, and two positive ions. So that means that you need to predict what is going to go to the negative electrode 
and what is going to go to the positive electrode. So in this case, the rule at the negative electrode is the least reactive element goes to the electrode. So in this case, hydrogen is less reactive than sodium, so you're going to get hydrogen gas given off. And with the positive electrode, if there is a halide ion in there, then that will be produced at the positive electrode. If not, oxygen will be produced. So in this case, we've got our chlorine present, present, so chlorine will be produced, Cl2. If a halide ion, remembering that halide is a halogen from group 7, so if halide ion is present, that will go to the electrode. If not, oxygen is produced because it's to do with the hydroxide ion going to that electrode instead. So if not, oxygen is produced. And I'll show you an example of that in just a sec. So you might need to draw this out, show the ions in there, and predict what is going to be produced. So we've got hydrogen gas produced. We can test for that using a squeaky pop test. Comes up in paper two. Chlorine produced. Again, these tests come up in paper two, but you may see them as well. And to test for that, you would bleach, that bleaches, sorry, a damp litmus paper. So you would put blue litmus paper in and it would turn from blue to white. Left in solution then, you have a positive ion and a negative ion, so these are going to attract together and produce sodium hydroxide in the electrolyte that is left. So an example then of when oxygen might be produced, again if we had our chamber set up and we had our positive and our negative electrode connected to our power supply, This time, for example, if we had copper sulfate, we would have copper ions in there, sulfate ions, and the ions that are present in water, because it's copper sulfate solution. The same rule applies to the negative electrode in that the least reactive element goes to the electrode. So in this case, the two positive ones are copper and hydrogen. And out of those two, copper is less reactive, so copper will collect at that electrode. And for the positive electrode, you've got hydroxide and sulphate ions. As we don't have a halide ion present, we don't have a group 7 ion present, then our rule says that oxygen will be produced. So at this electrode, you will get oxygen given off, because the hydroxide goes there, and produces oxygen which is given off and water which goes back into the solution. Half equations is a topic for higher tier pupils only. Half equations can relate to electrolysis and it all relates to the two words oxidation and reduction but this time in terms of electrons so oil rig will help you remember that oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. Now this is different to the chemical reaction that we looked at earlier which is in terms of gaining oxygen and losing oxygen. So this is definitely in terms of electrons. If you lose electrons you're oxidized. If you gain electrons you're reduced. So let's look at um, lead bromide again where we got Pb2 plus and Br minus in solution. We said that lead would go to the negative electrode and bromine we would be produced at the positive electrode. So you need to be able to write half equations for these which basically just shows what's happening in terms of electrons. So lead ions, when they go to the negative electrode they gain electrons and turn into lead atoms. So that is the half equation for what is happening at this electrode and because they're gaining electrons reduction is happening at the negative electrode. Lead ions are turning into lead atoms. So with bromine, bromide ions 
lose electrons and they turn into the bromine molecule. So bromine goes around in pairs, so it must be Br2. So we need to balance that up by a 2 there and a 2 there. The other way that you can write this around for the half equation for bromine, you may see it the other way by saying that bromide ions turn into bromine atoms and lose two electrons. So for the positive electrode, there's two ways that you can write the half equation. Other examples, for example, hydrogen, the hydrogen ions were, were to go to a negative electrode, there they would gain electrons and turn into hydrogen molecules, which we'd need to balance up. And chlorine, for example, if chloride ions lost electrons, they would turn into chlorine. And again, we'd need to balance that. We'll start off by talking about exothermic and endothermic reactions. Exothermic reactions give out heat to the environment. or the surroundings as we call it. So exo, like exit, you're going out. So that might help you remember that exo means give out heat to the surroundings. And there's several different reactions. Most reactions are exothermic. So things like neutralization reactions, when you add an acid to a base. Respiration is an exothermic reaction. Energy is released during respiration, so it's an exothermic reaction. Metals and acids, anything that gets hot and shows that the energy is being released to the surroundings. These have several practical uses as well, for example in things such as hand warmers or self-heating cans where you can um, initiate a chemical reaction and, and heat up food. Endothermic reactions are the opposite. These reactions take in heat from the surroundings. So endo means take in heat, whereas we said exo means give out heat. Typical reactions that are endothermic are things like thermal decomposition reactions. Looking at their name, they use heat, thermal, to decompose or break things down. So they need to take in heat to break down um, particular chemicals. Um, photosynthesis, which is the opposite of respiration, is an example of an endothermic reaction. And practical uses um, are things like sports injury packs. So in here you will have an endothermic reaction which you can initiate and then put on an injury and you can imagine if you've hurt your knee or your leg there's going to be lots of heat from that injury which can be taken in by the endothermic reaction which will then cool down your injury and help it feel better. These diagrams show reaction profiles which show the overall energy transfer in chemical reactions. You have two lines on these. You have the reactants and the products. If you remember, all the chemicals on the left-hand side of the equation are the reactants, and they produce products. So in this reaction, in these reaction profiles, you just have to say what you see. You've got the progress of the reaction and energy. So in this case, the energy of the reactants is lower than the energy of the products. This means energy must have been put into the reaction because the products have more energy. So this reaction profile shows an endothermic reaction. Whereas with this one, again, say what you see, the reactants have more energy than the products. So energy must have been given out. So this is an exothermic reaction. When you're asked to explain why it's exothermic, you can say that the reactants are higher than the products, so they have more energy than the products, and the opposite way around for this one. 
So there's a couple of key points. You need to label these very carefully. If you're asked to label the activation energy, make sure you are doing so from the reactants up to the product, to the top of the products. And the same for this one here. This I'll label A, but it's the activation energy. This is the minimum amount of energy needed for a reaction to happen. And this comes up in paper two when you're talking about collision theory as well. So A is the activation energy. And the other thing that you might have to label is the overall energy change, which I'll just call delta H, because that's what we normally call it, overall energy change. And that's the difference between the reactants and the products. So here, this is the overall energy change and the energy is going up. And in this case here, you need to make it as exact as you can. This is the overall energy change and the energy is going down. So in this case, the delta H is negative, and in this case, the delta H or the change in energy is positive. The only other thing that you might be asked to do is show the effect of a catalyst on these diagrams. A catalyst provides an alternative pathway with a lower activation energy. It tends to come up in paper two, that definition, but here we can show an alternative pathway with a lower activation energy. So it's got to be lower than the activation energy here and in the same way on this side to show the catalyst. Now we'll discuss a required practical on exothermic and endothermic reactions. So with this practical, you will be asked to investigate the temperature change of a reaction and you might be asked to change a particular variable such as concentration or mass of the reactant and see what effect that has. The main thing with this practical is the reaction happens in a, in a polystyrene cup and you'll have a thermometer in there to see how the temperature changes in the reaction. But the main thing that they'll ask you is how to improve the um, apparatus in the equipment. The main things they'll miss off are a lid on the cup. Okay, so we must have a lid here and also a lid on the beaker would be preferable with the cup surrounded by some form of insulation. So they're the main improvements that you need to look for. Has it got insulation? Has it got a lid to prevent heat loss? Or in terms of endothermic heat actually going into the um, practical. So for example, if you want to look at an exothermic reaction, you could either do a neutralization reaction or you could, for example, put a metal in with an acid. And when you do that, you'll see a temperature rise and you can measure that on the thermometer. You might want to change the concentration of the acid, for example, maybe use 0.1 molar, 0.2 molar, etc. maybe up to one molar. And then you could see the effect that that has on the temperature change in the reaction. You could also do an endothermic reaction if you wanted to. For example, you could have water and something like potassium chloride. You could put those both into the cup and you could measure the temperature decrease this time in the reaction. And for potassium chloride, you might want to change the mass that you're using. So maybe start with 5 grams and then use 10 grams, 15 grams, etc. And see the effect that that has on the temperature change. So be, bear in mind that you might be asked for improvements in this investigation or you might, be able to, you might be asked to write a method from scratch for a particular reaction. If you're doing um, a neutralisation reaction, for example, maybe you're reacting hydrochloric acid with sodium hydroxide, for example. If you're using these two liquids, you must make sure that they start at the same temperature. So you might want to put those in a water bath, say at 25 degrees C before the reaction, 
and then you know that they both have the same starting temperature and that means that temperature is therefore controlled before the reaction begins. Bond energy calculations are for higher tier only and what you need to remember for these calculations is that energy is released when bonds are made and energy is needed or taken in when bonds are broken. So the second um, line is more easy to understand. So to break bonds between atoms, you need to put energy in. So energy is taken in, that makes sense. And this other one is the opposite effect of that, which is slightly harder to get your heads around. But whenever a bond is actually made, energy is released. So we can calculate the overall energy change in a reaction. In an exam, you'll be given the equation. Make sure it is balanced. Normally, they will balance it for you. They will give you the displayed formulas for the chemicals in the equation. And they will give you a table that shows the bond energies. Now, these are constants. You can look these up on the internet and you will be given these in exam. So, for example, the energy needed to break a CH bond is 413 kilojoules per mole. Alternatively, this would be the energy released when that bond is made, depending on whether you're making the bond or breaking the bond. So with bond energies, you need to add up all of the energies, all of the bond energies on the left-hand side, and then all of the bond energies on the right-hand side. So in this case, they've given you um, the displayed formulas and they will do in the exam so you need to make sure you circle all of the bonds and add all of them up so here we have four CH bonds so CH has a bond energy of 413 so we have four lots of 413 and we add that to two O double bond O bonds which have bond energy of 498 so 2 times 498 and on this side, again, make sure you circle all the bonds so that you don't miss any out. You've got C double bond O, C double bond O. So that's 799. So two lots of 799. Added to 1, 2, 3, 4 OH bonds. So four lots of 4, 6. Three. And be really careful, you notice when I was writing I nearly made a mistake there, you need to copy these numbers carefully from the table, otherwise you'll lose all of the marks. So if we add that up on the left hand side we've got a total bond energies of 2648 and on the right hand side a total of 3450. That will get you a couple of marks, your final steps you need to do is take 3450 from 2648. So do this number minus that number. And that gives you an answer of minus 802 kilojoules per mole. And that number there is the overall energy change in the reaction. And because it's negative, it gives you the clue that that is an exothermic reaction. If you remember back from the reaction profiles that we looked at, that means the reactants have more energy than the products, so the overall energy change here, delta H, is negative, hence that negative value there of minus 802 kilojoules per mole. So when you do this last calculation, it may well be a negative number or it might be positive.